Hello, everybody. We're going to get started right now. I'm Julie White. I'm the uh, president of the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory, and it's my pleasure to introduce Terry. I jumped at the chance to do this. I've been wanting to meet Terry for years, uh, and the opportunity never presented itself. I think I might be the only person in the county who hasn't met Terry, but uh, this, is, this is a good introduction. So finally, I'm getting to do that. I'm guessing that uh, most of you know Terry, but I think I'm going to tell you a few things that you might not know. Um, Terry's a homeboy. He grew up in the 350-acre family farm at Big Island and helped run it until 1976. His interest in all history, particularly ornithology, started in childhood leading to a diploma in wildlife management and ecology. Career, he worked as a resources technician at Glenora Fisheries Research, and later as an interpretive naturalist at Sandbanks Provincial Park. And then he delivered a series of outdoor interpretive programs at Quinty Conservation. But most people know him for his writing as a freelance writer for the Picton Gazette, the Napanee Beaver, the Belleville Intelligencer, and the Tweed News and his books, Birds of Prince Edward County, Up Before Five, and Naked in the Sand. And now he's working on a new book, Growing Up on Big Island. Terry runs his own business, Nature Stuff Tours and Things, with a very popular website, naturestuff.net. Terry has been a good friend to Petbo for many years, but also supported many other organizations, and his knowledge and generosity has been noted with the 2002 Pioneer Conservationist Award from Conservation Ontario, the 2004 Richards Education Award from the Federation of Ontario Naturalists, and the 2015 Gold Quill Award from the Canadian Community Newspapers Association. I'm going to hand it over to Terry in a second, but first let me um, mention that we're holding questions until the end, but if you have a question, use the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll get to that at the end. We're thrilled to have you here tonight, Terry, and I'm, everyone's, I'm sure, anxious to hear from you. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Julie. That's uh, a wonderful um, introduction. I appreciate that. Um, it's certainly a, a pleasure to have been invited to deliver this presentation this evening. I, I understand that there's a tremendous turnout um, which to me indicates a real keen interest in wanting to attract and, and enhance um, the bio, uh, biodiversity in your backyard. Uh, I want to stress though that what, am I, uh, what I'm offering tonight may not necessarily apply to every person listening, but hopefully you might be able to take one or two ideas back home with you and maybe apply them to your own backyard. And I will be using the term backyard, but it can also mean your front yard, your side yard. <laughs> and if I should slip in the term dooryard, well, that's just county speak. <laughs> that's a term that's apparently used in the Ottawa area, but we've used it here in the county in past years. Now, for several years, just in the way of introduction, when I used to work at Quinney Conservation in Belleville, I conducted a six week backyard naturalization course that was filled every year with, uh, with the maximum number of participants, which I think was either 24 or 26, I can't remember now. Uh, the course evolved each year from what was strictly a naturalization theme to one that also included backyard responsibility that dealt with such things as leaf mulching, wood chipping, composting, uh, because we felt that it all tied in with backyard responsibility. So in this presentation this evening, I'm going to condense that six week course to 45 minutes, maybe an hour, I hope not. I hope it's only 45 minutes. So I hope you enjoy it. Now, first thing I gotta do is share the screen and there's what I want there as I talk to myself. And where are we, slideshow. Current slide. Okay, well, in recent years, there's been an increasing interest in backyard naturalization and um, uh, backyard naturalization, some people uh, do not understand the term fully. It doesn't mean leaving your backyard 
to grow up into weeds necessarily, although that might be applicable in some cases where you have a huge backyard, um, but it's keeping things in a more natural state. I used to work for the Ministry of Natural Resources and every time they planted trees, they were planted in rows. <laughs> and you know, that's not natural. That's not the way nature is normally in the wild. So I like to see things just all mixed up and the main emphasis is on native plants, native trees uh, in order to attract wildlife. I also, um, called this presentation, what to expect and how to attract, because the whole purpose, of course, for most people were, was to attract wildlife. Now, if you look into the eyes of this raccoon, you'll notice a couple spots of red. Actually, that's the reflection of the jacket that the photographer was wearing when he took this picture. And the photographer is Peter Sporing, who uh, lives in Belleville. Um, th there are some um, hazards, of course. Not everyone wants raccoons. Uh, you might be attracting animals that you don't really want, or at least in the numbers that you might end up getting. Uh, so this presentation looks at that aspect as well. So persuasion and dissuasion, that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, so why do we why do we want to encourage wildlife to our backyard? Well, number one, they're entertaining. I mean, you might see something like this where a white-breasted nuthatch is, is doing a flyby when a, the feeder is already occupied by a chipmunk. So it provides entertainment for us, especially when we're confined to, to homes. Just excuse me for a minute. I have to get a, a cough drop going here. Um, So let's, um, let's take John and Mary, for example. We'll say that John and Mary have just moved to the county from, we'll say, Toronto. Uh, they've never lived out in the country before. And John opens the uh, curtains one morning and he sees a deer in his front yard. And he says, oh, Mary, come and have a look at this. We've got a deer. I wonder what we need to do to keep it here. So he goes to County Farm Center in Picton Farm Supply in Picton, and um, they suggest that he get a, a little bag of deer pellets. They look a little bit like wood pellets, but they're made for deer uh, to eat. And he's, he said to, to put them out into a little pile and maybe that'll keep the deer around so he can enjoy them the next morning. Uh, so he does that and the next morning he has two deer there. So he's getting really excited, John is. So John goes back to uh, County Farm Center and Picton Farm Supply, gets some more advice from them. And they recommend that uh, he get a little more, uh, maybe get a, you know, a 25 pound bag of deer pellets and put them in different little locations and you know, to give the, the deer a chance to feed. So he does that, looks out his window the next morning and this is what he sees. Now, <laughs> This is a bit of an exaggeration, of course, although this is a, a genuine picture. This actually did happen, but I imagine these homeowners were in, intentionally uh, trying to attract these deer because you can see all the various piles here. Uh, you probably won't have a situation like this, but it does give you an idea of what can happen uh, when you get too much of a good thing. So a quick lesson in habitat. We want to attract wildlife, but how do we go about doing it? Well, it's very important to realize that habitat must meet four basic needs. Uh, this is my late wife. She passed away from liver cancer, I guess it's three years ago now, and she just loved the wildlife in, in our backyard. Although I must admit this was not taken in our backyard, although we did have chipmunks and still do. Uh, this was actually taken uh, at John and Janet Foster's uh, lovely uh, property back near Tweed. They're uh, Canadian uh, nature film makers, as you probably know, and we had a barbecue back there one day, and my goodness, we couldn't hardly eat because these chipmunks kept coming and jumping up on the picnic table and surrounding us for more peanuts. <laughs> okay, the number one requirement for uh, attracting wildlife to your backyard is food, of course, very obvious. And it can be in the form of insects for this red-eyed vireo, or maybe the red-eyed vireo will provide food for a passing hawk. And that's all part of 
the food chain and attracting wildlife. The number two requirement, of course, is water, and this can be in the form of a bird bath or it can be a, um, a water feature in your yard. Or if you're lucky, you might have a stream running through or live near a shoreline where that water will be present and you will certainly attract wildlife by making certain that you have water. Shelter is the third one. Now, what I mean by shelter is that's where any particular species is going to raise their young, whether it's um, behind the bark of, of a tree or whether it's at the top of a tree in the case of a bird nesting up there or maybe in the tree uh, in the case of a woodpecker, uh, maybe on the ground for some other type of, of critter, you do need the shelter um, to form that number third requirement. And number four is space. And what I mean by space is that almost every species of wildlife uh, uh, requires a certain amount of real estate, we'll say. And that can vary according to species. Uh, that's why if, say, you have only an acre of property, you may only have two or three pairs of robins because they will not allow any more of their species into that restricted space. And it varies according to species. Now, tree swallows, of course, they're a little more forgiving and you can really pack them in. Um, pileated woodpeckers, they would require, a, a single pair would require about 100 to 150 acres of woodland. And that's why you don't see a whole lot of pileated woodpeckers in Prince Edward County, the Leopoldi area, because they require uh, such a, a large living space. So food, water, shelter, and space. And once we realize that we uh, what their requirements are, then we can manage the habitat. We can um, alter or manipulate um, any one or more of those requirements and control the amount of wildlife or the amount of numbers of species that you have in your yard. Um, we're already doing this. If that sounds kind of strange to you or you don't really know how to do it, uh, we're probably already doing it. Let's take starlings, for example. Um, starlings are not everyone's favorite bird to have at their bird feeders in the, in the winter time because they leave quite a mess behind. They're not a sanitary bird by any means. And you throw out a piece of suet and suddenly you realize it is just covered with starlings. So what you do is you put that uh, suet in an upside down feeder uh, that the nuthatches and woodpeckers and chickadees can easily access. But starlings aren't um, uh, quite as agile as they are. So in that at that little bit of effort there, you've, you've, controlled, um, you've controlled the amount of food or the availabil availability of the food for that particular species. So you just kind of work with that. So food, water, shelter, and space. Uh, it used to be called the uh, web of life. We still call it that. Biodiversity is another name for it. And that's uh, the action of all these animals and birds and, and, and plants all interacting together. And it's all based uh, under the premise that all wildlife has worth, even skunks. Uh, every species uh, ha is on this earth for a reason. Uh, even skunks are doing a wonderful service by ridding your lawn of, um, of grubs and so forth. Um, and once you understand the habits of skunks, you realize they're not really that bad an animal to have around. They're not gonna go out of their way to, sp to spray you at all. Now, many species are declining. This is a vesper sparrow. And when I was on the farm back uh, prior to 1976, uh, we had a lot of vesper sparrows uh, on our farm because we had a lot of hay fields and they liked the borders of the hay fields where there are trees growing and that's where they sing. And one of my most delightful memories was walking back the lane um, after the evening milking and just relaxing to the sound of all these vespers furrows singing. Well, they're not on that farm now because the habitat has changed. Those fields are now grown up to ash trees and red cedars and uh, buckthorn. Um, so they're not, uh, th 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 that habitat isn't as appealing to vespers furrows uh, as it used to be. So what's been happening? This is an aerial I took, uh, gosh, it must be 20 years ago now, and some of you may recognize it as Wapoose, the Wapoose area. 
And I like this photo because I don't think that much has changed in the last two decades at Wapus. Uh, you still see these small fields and that's what I like to see because you have these, uh, what I call wildlife corridors through here, these fence rows, and it gives uh, wildlife a chance to go from one habitat to another. Um, if, if uh, well, the current trend seems to be uh, to, um, for farmers to take these fence rows out, these important corridors and make, we'll say this was a farm, uh, make this farm into one huge field. And what that does is that uh, the animals um, that find these little fragmented pieces of habitat, uh, they become weak and, uh, and it declines the genetic pools that grow there because these animals are not able to safely cross open fields and get to new habitats um, uh, to connect with other members of their species. Now, remember how we used to manage our properties. Now, my father, God rest his soul, his idea of uh, woodlot management, for example, uh, was to cut all the dead trees in, uh, in our woodlot and take out the brush and then pile it in a great big pile. And at some point in the year, we'd go back with a wagon load of uh, maybe straw bales and rubber tires and maybe some old oil and we set it all ablaze. I mean, that, <laughs> that was, uh, that was uh, you know, good management back then. Uh, now we have learned a lot from those days that these trees that we call snags are very important to wildlife. Um, I always say that messy is good habitat. Now this rotting log here, uh, you can't see it now, but it's kind of interesting to think that there are hundreds and hundreds of species of insects, little animals, fungi and everything. And they're all working on this log to gradually decompose it and, and, and get it down to uh, a usable uh, component of the forest floor that uh, the smaller trees growing up beside it can use. And while it's doing that, of course, it's providing shelter for all these little uh, critters there. And it eventually composes or um, biodegrades on its own uh, and uh, disappears, just the same as all those old trees when they fall down naturally and, and uh, the old brush piles and so forth. You don't really have to uh, rake the forest floor at all. Brush piles for habitat. Believe it or not, there are actually brochures out there that teach you how to build a brush pile so that it uh, appeals to wildlife. It's really not that difficult to do. I have three, maybe, no, I have five. I actually have five little brush piles in different remote corners of my, of my yard and they are being utilized by wildlife all the time. Uh, there's never a, a day goes by that you don't see birds flitting around there getting insects and using them for shelter and, and what have you and of course other little animals too. So it's, it's great habitat to have if you're able to do that. Snags provide homes to many species of wildlife. Um, this is a picture of a tree that I took at uh, Potter, uh, Potter's Creek Conservation Area at Belleville of a dead tree. I just couldn't resist it. It had all these little holes and cavities in. And these are very important for species like flying squirrels, um, northern sawwood owls, which are banded every year at Prince Edward Point, of course, in the fall of the year. They're very uh, tiny, about six inches high, as well as the eastern screech owl and the great crested flycatcher, which has just returned, I understand. Uh, one was uh, heard today up in the Caring Place area. And of course, our friend, the raccoon. And these animals, they all depend on natural cavities uh, for their homes. They're not able to excavate on their own. They depend on, on um, uh, these cavities being available for their use. So how do you bring it to the backyard? Uh, maybe you live in town. Maybe your next door neighbor wouldn't want to brush pile up against his fence. Uh, but there are a lot of things that you can do. Now, let's take this person for example. Um, she has um, um, a little piece of property on uh, in Belleville. It's not even a half an acre. It's right off, uh, it's on a side street off Farley Avenue. And her name is Priscilla Wagner. 
She moved there from Maydock a number of years ago. The backyard, which was probably no more than 50 by 40 feet, if it was that, uh, was all grass. And over the years, she and her husband uh, spaded it all up. And there's not a bit of grass in there now, except on the walking path. And she's planted all kinds of uh, wildflowers that appeal to uh, bees and butterflies. And she did her research well. You go out into her backyard now, sit in those chairs, and you're just absolutely surrounded by butterflies and uh, various insects all working together harmoniously. Uh, so it's, you can do a lot in just a small backyard. And, and yes, yeah, she's in between. She's tightly in between uh, other neighbors, but her neighbors, uh, they may not understand what she's doing, but they tolerate her. <laughs> she um, has a tall board fence right around the property, so uh, she doesn't bother anybody. And, uh, you know, they talk back and forth. They're friendly. Let's take a little bit larger property. Let's take a two acre property. And I'll start right off by saying that this is my two acres on Big Island on the corner of uh, South Big Island Road and Sprague Road. This was probably taken in 2012 because in 2013, Quinty Conservation did a massive rehabilitation project here in the Big Island Marsh. It was about a $5 million project. The end result was, um, three ponds, uh, two of them were six acres in size and they were all connected by channels. Um, it, it improved the marsh considerably, uh, wildlife came back, but the big bonus was that a 12 acre pond, more like a lake, uh, was constructed right outside my, uh, the, my frontage. So I have wildlife there that I haven't seen ever because that marsh has always been completely filled in, choked with cattails. Um, so it was a wonderful project. But anyway, my two acres, if you can imagine, my wife and I, after we sold the farm, uh, we lived near Baycrest Marina. That's where the farmhouse was. So we, when we sold the farm, we retained a couple acres off the corner here. And this is actually um, a barnyard when we first moved here, it belonged to the, the people across the road. He had a stroke and, and I bought his farm. And uh, uh, that was before we sold the farm. Um, so if you can imagine this property, this two acres having virtually nothing, not a shrub, not a tree, even the killdeers were nervous because it was too open. <laughs> um, the remnants of the old farm buildings are here. This is the foundation to the barn that once stood here. This is the house. Uh, this was a machinery shed, which I used for storage and, and all my equipment. Uh, this is a historic hop house. Uh, descendants of mine used to grow hops in the county and this was the original hop house. And, and I spent a lot of time uh, refurbishing that and, and restoring it. Uh, believe me, I wouldn't stand up there now like I did back uh, uh, 40 some years ago. Uh, all these trees were planted. Uh, we searched around to get the right species of trees or shrubs and everything growing here. My son at the age of eight planted all these trees. These are silver maples and they did very well down here because they get the benefit of the high water table. Here you can see where the soil gets a little shallow and we've got some issues with uh, limestone bedrock being very close to the surface. This is a big issue. I don't like a lot of lawn, but I've tried for 40 years to plant something there and nothing would grow. And it's simply because at this time of the year right now, it's uh, very wet. It has been known to be flooded. In the summer, it dries up like concrete. So everything I planted did well for that species as long as the conditions were right. I had red osier dogwood all over the place. They died when it, we had our first drought. I had gray dogwood, uh, which is a little more drought tolerant. These are the only two left. I had white cedars growing here. The only thing I can grow apparently is machinery. So I'm on the lookout for any old machinery. It grows very well here in this front lawn. There's an old plow there. Uh, so you, you know, you do what you can, but we have done very well with attracting wildlife here. So on medium sized properties, uh, here's a property on Point Peter Road that was about, I think 17 acres. 
he no longer lives here. He lives in uh, Rossmore, but I understand that the new owners are um, handling or managing the property much the way he did. But here he had the best of both worlds. He had um, he had a, a, a nice little area of, of uh, mowed lawn here, keep the mosquitoes down, but all the other property was allowed to grow up wild. But he had to manage it because even wild areas, if you let them grow up wild, eventually you're going to get things like uh, dog strangling vine, uh, you'll get buckthorn coming in and various other unwanted species. So he mowed a path through here so that he can kind of you know, keep track of things. The golden rod, very good for attracting bees so, and butterflies, so he let that grow up. Um, milkweed, uh, there was a lot more milkweed behind me when I took this picture. And down in here, I believe this was uh, butter and eggs or toad flax. So, you know, plants that were good, that weren't doing any harm, he let grow up. And it's really a matter of what you want. Um, his next door neighbor, and I'm not condemning him by any means, uh, you know, he preferred to have a mowed lawn. But if you have a nice mowed lawn like this, uh, no trees at all, you know, and you're trying to attract wildlife, you're not going to have as much success as the fellow across here, uh, across the, the uh, line here, uh, where he's got bluebird houses up and uh, goldenrod growing and everything. Else. It's a matter of what you want, really. So what can I do in just my backyard? Well, this is my little water feature that I have. Uh, it's just a tiny one. I've got goldfish in there and there's nothing like water to attract uh, bird life. And especially if it's running and there is a little waterfall in behind here. And if you have the expertise and the wherewithal and, and the materials, you can certainly expand on that and make a nice large uh, water feature and attract even more species. We always recommend that you plant native trees, but make sure they're native. I'm afraid that the word native is uh, being used as a marketing tool because it's a very popular uh, term that people are hopping on to now. And you have to really investigate to make sure that what you are planting is native. And I like to think of native as something that's growing right here in the Bay of Quinty area or Prince Edward County. This is a honey locust. I got it from a, a nursery up near Morrow Bank called Golden Bow. I, I loved it up there. He always signed his letters that he sent to me, Mr. Bow. I thought that was kind of cute. But anyway, I bought these uh, honey locust trees. Uh, he said they were native and they grew fast. And they did. I had three of them. Uh, for reasons best known to myself, I guess, I planted one under the hydro wire, so I had to cut that down eventually. But I still have two up, and they're supposed to attract wildlife, but I never had much luck um, attracting much of anything. But they do blend in. They sort of assist the other more native trees in attracting wildlife. They do produce these long pods, and I'm telling you, they are long. They're about 10, 11 inches in length. Um, they're supposed to attract deer. That's nice if you want to attract deer, not everyone does. But uh, as far as birds nesting in it, I've never had much luck that way. So um, honey locusts, they're not, they are native to Ontario. They're native to Southwestern Ontario. The locust that we like to think of as being native is probably the black locust that you're more familiar with. They're growing out of sandbanks. They're a good sand stabilizer. They grow fast, they reproduce fast but black locusts are not native to this area. They do well, but they're not native. Uh, they're native to uh, Eastern United States. So why do we want to grow native plants? Well, it's kind of obvious, it attracts wildlife, it, uh, adapts readily to local climate, all the obvious things that uh, your wildlife grew up uh, with these plants are used to them, are used to their, um, uh, what they offer in the way of, of nesting habitat and also what they offer in the way of seeds and berries and so forth. And there's really no um, big mystery about native trees. Uh, these are all native trees that we're all very familiar with. Uh, this is a silver maple, that row of trees that my son planted around the uh, perimeter of our property. Um, they grow fast, but they do like to keep their feet wet. Uh, 
but I've had warbling vireos nesting in them almost every year, Baltimore Orioles, so they're a great thing for that. Um, hackberry, it's more of a south southern uh, Carolinian type species, but there's lots of them here, and, and there's even a little uh, patch of them out at Sandbanks that, um, that I found. So all these trees are great for uh, attracting wildlife. Uh, shrubs, this is uh, staghorn sumac. Staghorn sumac is, is very common, not to be confused with poison sumac, which we do not have in the Bay of Quiddy area. It only grows down around the uh, Niagara area. And, and I did come across a patch of it that I was aware of at Frontenac Park, but it doesn't grow here. This is quite edible. Uh, birds love the seeds from red uh, from the staghorn sumac, and if you find that they are untouched, you can harvest them yourself, uh, mash them down, and make a delicious um, sumac jelly, which my wife always made. It was it was absolutely delicious. You can also make a sumac lemonade, uh, which references will tell you is a delicious sumac lemonade. I guess if you put enough sugar in anything, it'll be delicious. I never cared for it myself. But all these uh, shrubs are great for attracting wildlife because of the seeds and berries they produce. The red osier dogwood, like I mentioned earlier, grows best in, in wet areas. Gray dogwood can take a little bit of, um, uh, of uh, drought conditions. Service berry is excellent. I have two or three of those myself. High bush cranberry, I'd be a little careful about planting too many of those. The uh, fruit that they produce don't seem to be that readily eaten. It's a kind of a last resort type thing. Um, choke cherry, winterberry, all of them are excellent. Don't overlook what's just across the fence growing wild. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that you go on a go and, and dig up all these native plants and so forth uh, to save a few dollars here and there. Uh, because a lot of them are rare and also you would be depleting, uh, you know, these um, native shrubs from their natural habitat. But in the case of red cedars, in Prince of Burr County especially, uh, there's no lack of red cedars and they're uh, very easy to grow. I've got a couple growing myself. They grow very fast. They provide excellent habitat for uh, nesting birds and also uh, feed for wax wings and whatever else that uh, happens to be passing by. And I don't think anyone's going to object to you crossing the fence and digging up somebody's uh, red cedar. <laughs> you might want to ask first. Flowering crab is another good tree. It's a cultivar of the crab apple tree. They produce all these little miniature apples that remain on the tree during the winter months. Um, I've had pine grow speaks feasting on those, uh, robins, uh, all kinds of birds coming. Attracting butterflies and hummingbirds. Well, again, lots of um, uh, native plants that you're probably already familiar with, New England aster, wild columbine, cardinal flower especially. And I don't want to see you digging up columbine or cardinal flower from uh, any of the locations where they occur in the county. I don't. I don't reveal where they're growing. Uh, they're too gorgeous a flower and not that common actually in our area. But all these plants are available at nurseries. Uh, again, you have to wonder just how native they are, but you know, it's better than nothing. Attracting monarchs specifically. Uh, milkweed, we've all heard about common milkweed and common milkweed does indeed uh, attract monarchs, but they seem to be more drawn to butterfly milkweed and swamp milkweed. Butterfly milkweed, uh, I don't really know how common it is in the county. I have seen it growing. Uh, apparently it's on the plant list at Sandbanks. It grows up in the uh, Menzo Nature Reserve north of Deseronto. Uh, it seems to prefer dry areas, but uh, modern butterflies really love it. And swamp milkweed is very common in the county wherever there's a wet area. It looks a little bit like Joe Pie weed. Attracting mason bees. Um, there's been a lot of interest in recent years uh, in attracting what we call um, uh, solitary bees, not to be confused with social bees such as honeybees and bumblebees. Um, they're, they're called uh, solitary bees because the female 
will lay the egg. In this particular case, let's take this artificial um, nest structure here, where the female will go in, lay an egg, deposit a little bit of pollen uh, in order to feed the larva when it emerges, and then put a little bit of material in behind it. If it's a, a mason bee, it'll be a little bit of uh, like a masonry material. Uh, if it's something like, um, oh, what do you call them? I can't think of the name of it now. Um, hmm. uh, I think it's called a grass carrying bee, which is also um, a solitary bee. Uh, they will stuff it full of grass uh, and I've had them as well. These little stickers come with it. The idea is that you cover up the little holes. You'll see there's a variety of different sized holes for different insects. Uh, that's to prevent um, chickadees and so forth from coming along and, and uh, drilling in there to, to get the, um, the, the larva. And then you have to remember, of course, in the spring to take them off so they can come out. These are also available. Um, I had a huge one uh, that I got at Home Hardware. This is a funny story. I got, a, I got one at Home Hardware. It was endorsed by uh, gardening expert Mark Cullen. And anything that's endorsed by Mark Cullen, of course, is going to have a bit higher price tag on it. Well, I think I paid something like $80 with the tax and everything, mounted the thing. Um, bees came like crazy. Uh, especially these grass carrying bees, filled it right up, it was very successful. And then came the woodpeckers and they completely riddled that whole structure. It was just reduced to sawdust and chips. Um, so the important lesson I learned from that is uh, you can put a piece of netting over the uh, outer edge of this and that'll allow the insects to get in but prevent any birds from uh, gaining access. So there's about 400 species of these solitary bees and they really make great neighbors because um, the females, which are the only ones that have the stingers, they don't sting. You have to actually physically pick one up, squeeze it before it'll be prompted to, uh, to sting you at all. So you can walk amongst them and they won't sting you at all. Uh, they're great to have around and they're great uh, pollinators. I'm in the process of making something like this right now. Uh, I do not have much in the way of carpentry skills, but surely to goodness I can come up with something similar to this with no problem. The idea is to put all kinds of rubble in here, pieces of split wood, um, stalks of weeds, anything here. We have pieces of bark. I've seen others put leaves, old, uh, dried leaves in here and here we have some blocks. These are about maybe six or seven inches in length and holes are drilled in here. I like to see different sized holes to appeal to different sized solitary bees. And something I came upon last year, there's a, a growth of Phragmites, which of course is an invasive grass. I came across it in the um, Catholic cemetery in Picton and I couldn't help but notice that when I broke the stem uh, that they were hollow, just the right size. So I harvested, uh, without apology, a bunch of this uh, Phragmites, brought it home and cut the stems and I will be using them uh, once I get this thing built um, as, as another uh, possible nesting site for them. So there's something you can do that's very easy to put together, just use your own imagination. Other ideas for attracting wildlife. This is a butterfly house. Butterflies don't nest in them at all. Uh, they use them for shelter. Uh, for instance, some of the earlier uh, ones um, uh, that uh, come in the spring might be prone to, um, you know, snowstorms like we had not too long ago that came up suddenly. Uh, they will really appreciate having a place like this to get out of, out of the weather. So they don't lay their eggs in there necessarily. It's just a shelter and they're quite decorative. So you can get something like that. I have one of these. Uh, this is a butterfly feeder. I have one exactly like that. Um, you just put a, a nectar in here. Uh, I just use uh, the four to one mixture that I use for hummingbirds. And these wicks uh, soak up the moisture from the, uh, from the container and the butterflies come and they sip the nectar. And there are also little holes here where you can put fruit. In this case, we have some bananas here. 
don't forget bats. Um, there are um, about six species of bats that we have in Prince Edward County, and all of them are um, in trouble. Uh, they, um, well, we have the uh, little, uh, little brown bat, and I think the big brown bat too is subject to white nose syndrome, which is decimating the, uh, the numbers of them. Uh, wind turbines in areas, uh, fortunately, out of Prince Edward County. Uh, we don't have that concern here, but if we did, um, it would be killing off um, the, the, uh, the bats for sure. It's not so much uh, that they would hit the turbine blades, but they would encounter a difference in air pressure at the base of the turbine, which would uh, cause their lungs to explode, something we'll call barrel trauma. Uh, so certainly put up shelters for bats. Uh, chances are very good you'll get them. This one would hold probably about 50 bats. Um, they're the night patrol. They clean up the insects in your backyard. Nesting boxes, this is what I call the, your common garden variety nesting box, uh, which will appeal to many species of birds. The main issue, of course, is the entrance hole should be about an inch and a half. And it's not so much that it has to be this size or that size for different species. It's where you put it. If you put it in a, an area such as this, you will probably attract tree swallows, maybe eastern bluebirds if you're lucky. If you put it on the edge of the woods, you might get a chickadee nesting in that same box. And if you put it in uh, the woods, uh, chances are good you have uh, white-breasted nuthatches, which I've had uh, when I was on the farm. I always used to get nuthatches nesting in there. Um, just a basic design. I like the idea of this design where the front panel swings up and you can easily clean out the box after the nesting season. No perch. Perches are just purely ornamental. Birds don't need perch, just think of their natural habitat. When they see a natural cavity, chances are very good they're not going to have a, a perch provided for them. Bird feeding. Um, just very briefly, there is nothing wrong about bird feeding. Uh, don't pay any attention to what I call the soothsayers who wag their finger at you and tell you that bird feeding is wrong, you're interrupting migratory habits, they're going to become dependent on you. Uh, that's all a myth. Unfortunately, there are people out there who, you know, who can't find anything good to say about anything and bird feeding is certainly a, a target for them. Um, birds treat your feeder as nothing more than just another stop in many uh, that they visit over the course of the day. And if you've never fed birds before, you're going to be bombarded with a plethora of, of, um, of different designs. There are good ones, there are bad ones. Um, like anything else, the more you pay, the better the quality. And here's an example here. This is uh, a feeder made by a company called Droll Yankees out of uh, Rhode Island. This feeder, well, when I bought it about 20 years ago was about $90, but when you pay that much for a feeder like this, it's guaranteed for a lifetime. You never, ever have to replace it. You never, ever have to pay for any broken part. Um, about 10 years ago, it fell from um, where I had it hanging for whatever reason, I can't remember now. And the feed port down here broke in half. So I took it to Picton Farm Supply where I actually bought it. And Bryce Cronk, being Bryce Cronk, he never said a word. He just went into his back room, uh, shuffled around in, his, in a cardboard box and came out with new feed ports, handed it to me, said, here you go, have a nice day, take care. And uh, I never had to pay a cent. Yes, there are squirrel proof feeders and you will pay for them. This one uh, again is made by Droll Yankees. It's called the Flipper and it's about $200 or a little more, but you get $100 worth of feed protection. The other $100 is pure entertainment. If you go onto YouTube and click on uh, the Flipper Feeder by Droll Yankees, you're going to come up with some pretty entertaining videos of squirrels repeatedly trying to hang on to this perch because as soon as they grab a hold of that perch, um, uh, it's weight activated, so it will activate a, a motor, a battery driven motor 
And that thing will spin around very, very fast and just flip that squirrel right off. And it's amazing how many times a squirrel will try and get onto that feeder uh, without success. There are other types of squirrel proof feeders. Uh, this is a company known as Brome. Uh, I support them uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, they're sold at Picton Farm Supply. They're sold at the Birdhouse Nature Store in Brighton. They all range between 90 and $100. This is a brand new one that just came out a couple winters ago. And I, of course, I had to go buy one. Um, it's all weight activated. It holds the little uh, suet packs. And as soon as anything heavier than um, these birds uh, uh, get on it, the whole shell comes down and covers up the feed ports. Likewise with the peanut feeder, same idea, same idea with this general purpose feeder. It's all weight activated, uh, guaranteed for a lifetime. Um, you'll never regret it if you buy one of those. Now, just a little bit on um, mixed bird feed. I came upon a couple very disturbing messages on Facebook one day, not too long ago. Someone asking, where can I go to get the cheapest bird feed? Well, I was almost tempted to uh, write in saying, if you are looking for the cheapest bird feed, give it up. Take down your bird feeders because your heart's just not in it. Um, I tell people to avoid big box stores where you'll get feed that looks like this on the right hand side. You can probably count the number of uh, sunflower seeds here and that's the staple food. There are a few peanuts to their credit but look at the rest of the seed. Um, it's mostly wheat and oats. And do you know what likes wheat and oats? House sparrows will love you for it. Um, pigeons will love you for it, as will blackbirds. It's just put in there as fillers. These big box stores uh, are in the business to move product. Where you get into stores uh, such as the Birdhouse, I'm a big promoter of the Birdhouse Nature Store. In fact, I'm on my way first thing tomorrow morning to go up and get another big order. I can't believe I'm spending over $200 every time I go up there, but I don't smoke and I don't drink. I spend money on bird feed. <laughs> That's me. Um, but anyway, uh, this food was designed by a person by the name of Connie Crow. She was the original owner of the Birdhouse Nature Store when it was located in war. She paid close attention to what was coming to her feeders, uh, what they were eating and in what quantity, and came up with a formula that is still being used today by the new owners at, the, uh, at their new location in Brighton. Her name is uh, Bobby Wright. Um, it's a secret formula. They won't even share it with me. It's like Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> I know what's in it, uh, but I don't know uh, the quantity of each. And I don't really need to know. I just know it's, it's good food. And when I use it, I never have a bit of waste. It's, it's, it costs a little more, but it's well worth the money. And there are places where you can get bird feed around here locally too. Uh, Carson's on um, uh, Wilson Road, just north of Wellington. Is, is a good source. Uh, even the f uh, farm feed stores like um, uh, Picton Farm Supply, County Farm Center, the mixture tends to be a little bit better. And if you see lots of sunflower seed in it and peanuts, you know it's a darn good mixture. Um, Belmo area, Thrasher Feeds, um, TS, well, I guess it's not called that now, but any of the, um, the farm feed stores uh, is an excellent source. Uh, to get your bird feed. Just avoid the big box stores, please. Um, offering water to birds in the winter time. It's a good idea. Again, you're going to have people wag their fingers at you and say, oh, the birds will freeze when they go into the water in the winter time. No, they won't. Um, they know when it's safe to bathe. Uh, they need water in the winter just as much as they do in the summer. These are sold as, as heaters. They're not really heaters, they're de-icers. They just keep the water barely above freezing. Uh, so they take very, very little electricity. And with these submersible heaters or de-icers, you can actually utilize an existing bird bath. This is mine. Um, this has the element built right into the basin. Uh, 
this is just a flat rock I threw in here, so they have to perch on. And uh, when you're talking about feeding birds in the winter, don't overlook summer feeding. Uh, of course, we all of us feed hummingbirds, and they're back right now coming to feeders. But in the summer, you'll get a whole different clientele. You'll get the American goldfinches, which wait until July almost before they start nesting. So until that time, they're flying away with a kind of a devil, devil may care attitude and uh, coming to your feeders and having a wonderful time eating niger seed and black, black oil sunflower seed. Right now, these are appearing, not so much the indigo bundings. I haven't heard of any indigo bundings yet this spring, but they're, they're on migration. They do nest here, but most of them when they come to your feeders are just passing through. So they may only stay for a week or so. Uh, Baltimore Orioles are here now and rose-breasted grosbeaks. Baltimore Orioles will love your oranges. Um, I have them coming to my oranges right now, uh, a little spike. So it's, um, uh, it's, it's great to have these. And then they have little containers too where you can put in some uh, uh, grape jelly. So a few of the birds that I've attracted uh, since we started naturalizing our backyard, we've had uh, brown thrashers nest for three years in succession, bringing their young to the feeder. And that's always a cool thing, you know, when they bring their young to the feeder. I have woodpeckers bringing their young to the feeder. Uh, and that's always um, a kind of a highlight. Uh, catbirds nest almost every year. Uh, White-throated sparrows passing through right now. They will nest locally, maybe not in your backyard, but certainly they're a treat when they come to your feeders at this time of the year. And, and the white crown sparrows are here right now as we speak, still happily singing away, but they don't nest here. They nest way up in the Hudson Bay lowlands. So they'll be disappearing shortly. Yellow warblers, we've had yellow warblers in our backyard. Um, magnolia warblers as a transient, they're on migration, so they may stop in your habitat and, and feast on the insects that uh, they've attracted. Uh, Black-throated green warblers may nest, although mostly they go to the more wooded areas. So the yard list, everybody who has, um, you know, doing backyard naturalization, they always want to keep a yard list. And I'm a bit of a purist. Um, a lot of people, when they make a yard list, they include everything that they hear while standing in their yard. Now that bird may be singing two fields away. It goes onto their yard list. I don't. Uh, I'm more of a purist. I have to have the bird touch terra firma before it will be included. Now some, if they're hunting, like a um, northern harrier, it will be added because it's actively using my, my habitat. Um, I have done a little bit of cheating. I once saw a black, uh, bald eagle flying towards me and I said, I got to get you on my yard list. So when it flew over my yard, I hollered up to it, yelled at the top of my lungs. And of course it looked down to see what all the racket was about. And because he displayed interest in what was going on below him, he got onto my bird list. <laughs> so I've got 132 species in the last 45 years or so on my two acres, uh, where before all I could get was a killdeer. So uh, I'm pretty proud of that. 24 species have nested. That's, I hope, apt to go up to 25 in the next few days if I can just find out where that pair of cardinals are <laughs> nesting. 19 mammals are on the list, 14 herptiles. That includes uh, reptiles and amphibians. And, and it also includes a blandings turtle, which we had one day. One of the birds that started nesting three years ago is this osprey. And he's nesting, as you can see here, on a television antenna. That antenna is about um, right at the top of a 60-foot self-supporting tower. I don't use any of that now, so they're welcome to it. I would like to get a proper platform up there one day if I can just get the wherewithal to do it. So we're very happy to have the ospreys nesting in our backyard. And then uh, an ermine. Uh, we've had them many times, uh, the weasel, and in this particular case, he's got a deer mouse. Now, this is where it all starts to come together. You think, okay, that deer mouse, something on my yard attracted that deer mouse to nest here, uh, to raise its young, and this ermine came along and nabbed it. So here we have biodiversity working right in front of our eyes, and it's a good feeling. Uh, 
we're kind of nearing the end of the presentation. Um, this is just an old barn foundation that I have and it's where I store things that I don't want people to see. Brush piles. Uh, one of the uh, emphasis that I put on the backyard naturalization course that I did was to utilize everything that you can on your property. I have never taken brush, leaves, any kind of yard waste to the dump. It has always been recycled right on my own two acres. Same with all these pruned branches. Uh, we get about a pile of these every year. And once a year, sometimes twice a year, I haul out my MTD uh, wood chipper and I put them through the wood chipper. It's a long process because you can't force these things. It's a small machine. Uh, it's about 15 years old. It doesn't look that old because it's kept under cover and taken well care of. Um, and it's only used once or twice a year but it's, it performs faithfully. And what it yields is this, a nice pile, that whole brush pile was reduced to this. And these are not the wood chips that you may be familiar with, the large wood chips. This grinds it down to almost uh, a mulch. And a mulch it is because I use it around my flower beds, I use it around my, my trees. And how does this all fit into attracting wildlife? Well, you're providing nutrient. properly. I do everything. Uh, oh, I, I Terry, in, your, your sound's going in and out. Yeah, I see that. I got, just got a message. Can you hear me all right now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. I don't know why. I've never had that message before. I usually have a good connection here. Um, but I throw everything into the composter. Yes, there is a danger of attracting. Um, just let me know if that happens again. Um, you are attracting environments and so forth, but that's all part of your backyard experience. Um, and, um, you know, I've had salamanders, I've had milk snakes, I've had everything in there. It's great. Uh, so this goes around my shrubs and my flower beds. Um, so it's, and I, I mulch everything. I have a Toro um, mulching mower. I mulch all the leaves. Uh, so I recycle everything. It's, it's actually caring for your little piece of heaven responsibly. Now, as we near the end, we're lining up for another drought year from what I hear. Very important to save as much rainwater as you can because you have to water these trees and shrubs that you've planted. Um, I have two of these 250 gallon uh, tanks that, and I, it takes all the rainwater from the roof and you'll be surprised at the amount of rainwater that we'll collect. Um, and I have, um, um, it's called a, a transfer pump. So I stick a garden hose on the end of the transfer pump and I can water all my flower beds uh, with that. And I have a backup one here. And this is the diverter. So I can determine where that water is going to go. So enjoy the wildlife that you've worked hard to attract. It's, it's a real treat, um, you know, with the current COVID situation, you know, to sit in your backyard, if only two acres, and enjoy all this wildlife. And it's not that hard to attract. So food, water, shelter, and space, it's all part of biodiversity. And thank you very much. I hope everyone is still being able to hear me. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. I will add that I do have handouts in a PDF form about uh, shrubs, native shrubs, native flowers, native uh, trees that I would be happy to email to you. And thank you. Did I go over time? No, you're good. Uh, I'm just trying to find my, there we are. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, Terry. Uh, it was great. Um, if anyone has any questions for Terry, if you want to use the chat box, it should be on the right hand side. Uh, we have a couple questions that have already come in um, from uh, JC. Uh, 
Um, unless uh, Julie wanted to, to speak, um, we could just dive right into the questions. Um, oh, you're on mute. Unmute, Julie. There yes, we sorry. go. <laughs> that's the, that's the uh, expression of the year for us. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm happy just to jump right into questions. That was wonderful, Terry. It was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of content. I'm sorry about that, but you know, it, it, it all ties in. Content. All right. um, JC would like to know what kind of wood chipper was that? That's an MTD. I got it from Home Hardware and it's, they offer two different sizes. I think it's eight and 10 horsepower. I got the 10 horsepower and I don't regret that. And uh, where can you buy red cedars? What seeds? R red cedars. Oh, red cedar. <laughs> yeah. You don't really need to buy red cedar. Just uh, if you know someone who has all kinds of red cedars in their field, you know, I'm sure they would be more than happy. They may smile at your request and then tell you to go help yourself. Um, they're fairly easy to dig up. Don't try and dig up too large a one. They have a bit of a tap root, uh, but you know, they, they, they take right off and grow. Just make sure you give them lots of water. And uh, Nina is asking um, if we'll be sending out a copy of this webinar and I can answer that. Um, yes, this webinar was recorded and it will be going up on YouTube. Um, and we're hoping to get uh, the link out to everyone who's uh, registered. Um, and then we can also probably put up the link on social media as well. Good, wonderful. Um, a lot of people saying, you know, thank you, Terry. It's been a wonderful presentation, enjoyable hour. It's great. Um, of course, anything that Terry does is fantastic. <laughs> oh, <Michelle>. um, <laughs> uh, if anyone, does anyone else have any questions? I'm not seeing anything else Let's see oh yeah again, again i apologize for the length of it and the content but i was trying to jam six weeks of material into an hour <laughs> uh oh another question um so someone has a hybrid tree of uh, silver maple and red maple is it still considered a native tree <laughs> oh i don't know i I, I would avoid red maple, uh, and I'll tell you a story. Now, the very first tree we planted, we wanted to go native. We didn't know anything about native trees at all. So I went to a nursery, said I wanted a red maple. Always wanted a red maple. So I planted it, and I think you know what it turned out to be. Norway maple. <laughs> but it, it still works. It's a shade tree for us. Uh, Karina is saying that she's looking forward to seeing you at the birdhouse tomorrow. Oh, hell yeah, that's right too, Karina. I'll be there about 10 o'clock. Um, Linda asked if you could send out the native shrub list. Yes, if I can get a, an email address, um, she can either email me at tspreg at explorenet.com or you can get the address right off my website at um, naturestuff.net. Just go into the contact uh, page. Um, or you can message me you know, on Facebook if you're on Facebook. Just I need your email address, and then I'll get them right to you. Um, I think we have a list of the people who have registered. Um, Peter was, was tracking that, so we might just be able to send it out to, to all the registrants so they they don't have to track you down and you don't get a hundred <laughs> emails from people asking for the same thing. Uh, um, a lot more people saying that it was a, it was a pleasure listening to you and it was uh, a lot of terrific ideas that they're going to implement into their own backyard or side yard or front yard. Well, um, like, like I say, you know, they may not be applicable in, in every situation, but you might be able to gain some inspiration or some ideas. Oh, someone's asking to type out the email. Sorry, uh, Terry, what's your email? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just type it out so they can... Uh, hang on a second. Can I just share again here? Uh, there we go. 
There it is, right there. Oh, okay. I, I so you're you're going to get some emails. <laughs> well, that's good. I don't mind. I don't mind. All right. Um, give give it another minute to see if anyone else has any more questions, and then we can wrap it up. I think. Oh, okay. There it is. Um, we have a groundhog that seems to have moved into our backyard and living under the deck. Could he cause any damage? And should this person be concerned? It probably won't cause any damage. If you have a garden, he's certainly going to do some damage in there. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. And, and one thing I didn't mention in this presentation uh, was the uh, controversial issue of live trapping. People tend to think live trapping nuisance animals, I, I don't consider any animal a nuisance, but that's beside the point. Um, live trapping is a humane way to go. It is not for a number of reasons. Um, you, are, um, you may be removing them from uh, families that they have, uh, that they're caring for. You are introducing them to uh, a new territory uh, that they are totally unfamiliar with. They don't know where to get food. You're introducing them to an area, uh, depending on the species, that may already be occupied. Squirrels are a little more resilient that way, but if you're talking about a, a large lumbering animal like a raccoon, it's going to be a battle to the finish. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a good way to go. And also, Think about it for a minute, you know, you're, you're turning your, your problems over to somebody else because they're going to be someone else's problems. So it's best to work within the four requirements of wildlife and alter the habitat or work with them rather than against them. And, um, you know, you may not succeed in every case, but certainly it's, it's better than life trapping. Uh, this person did say, yeah, they're, they're after her, her garden. Um, do you have any, maybe some tips or tricks maybe to, to help uh, maybe the groundhog steer them in a direction that's not the garden? <laughs> <laughs> Encourage them to go into a new direction. What you can do when all else fails is go on the internet, do a Google search and just type in problems with groundhogs and see what comes up. Um, it won't always work in every case, but at least it gives you a place to start. Offhand, I can't think of any solution uh, for groundhogs at all. Google is a friend to all. Usually has a plethora of, of answers. Um, we've got another question. If I plant a chamomile for the rabbits, will they leave my other plants alone? Well, we always hope they will. <laughs> <laughs> That's not always the case, I'm afraid. Again, uh, when it comes to rabbits, and I have problems with rabbits mainly in the wintertime, uh, I always have to make sure that I put chicken wire around all the shrubs that I value because invariably they're going to be pruning them, you know. <laughs> um, so you, you do have to take a little bit of uh, precautionary measures for sure. Someone suggested how about planting onions? Planting as onions as a deterrent? Sure, if it works. All right, a couple more seconds for any questions. Any last minute questions? No? Okay, doesn't look like there's any more questions. Um, Julie, do you want to close us out? Oh, I just want to thank everybody for participating in this. It's wonderful to see so many people come out to listen to Terry. Thank you again, Terry. Um, You're welcome. But I, I hope everyone kind of uh, check in on some of the other podcasts happening over the next uh, few weeks. You can find out more information at pepo.ca slash um, SBF. Good to see you all. Thank you. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Oh, you're welcome. Bye, everyone. Bye.